Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Birds on the Wire podcast, brought to you by the Phantom Mentor Content Engine, brought to you from Phantom Mentor Content Studios. This is a podcast dedicated to the in-depth coverage of the St. Louis Cardinals Baseball Club. We talk baseball like the fans want to talk it, and we are glad to bring you this episode. Welcome into the fifth edition of the Birds on the Wire podcast. I'm Colin Surrey alongside Josh Bobinette from the Phantom Mentor Studios. And Josh, a lot of excellent baseball since the last time we talked. Cardinals actually shut out for the first time all season today. But other than these last couple of games, it has been an incredibly impressive stretch of baseball for your St. Louis Cardinals. I tell you, uh, it's good to be back with you, Colin. We had to take last week off. Um, because of a couple circumstances out of our control, we'll say that, and we do apologize. I did get a couple emails about, you know, where the next show was, but to here it is. Uh, we will try to stay consistent. But yeah, um, we w- witnessed basically the blossoming of the Cardinals' uh, potential um, shown in full force over the last week, week and a half, um, and it was just. Um, well, it was the best Cardinal baseball I've seen in a few years, um, especially for this early in the season. Um, I, I've, I'm sure there's been teams that have won on some good runs over the last couple of years in the middle of summer, but to have a, a run like this, um, this early, and kind of take a little command of the division to kind of show people that you're you're there you're there for real was uh, certainly certainly uh, fun to watch. Well, in, incredibly encouraging, and you said it, the, the consistency over that stretch. The, they win 10 of 11 from the second game in that Mets series to the second-to-last game in the Washington Nationals series. And what really sticks out over that whole stretch, they had that, that one blip on the radar with that Reds game that was a blowout loss, 12-1. to mm-hmm. But the consistency with the offense – and the pitching, other than that 12-1 to loss, the Cardinals did not allow more than five runs in that stretch, and they also never scored less than three runs. In fact, they only scored less than five runs twice in that stretch, which really kind of shows you, I think, the, the biggest strength of this team moving forward is going to be the offense. Yeah, well, I mean... Uh... That hasn't been the case, right, over the last few years. And so we've relied heavily on our pitching in the, in the last few years to stay competitive. Um, you, you go into this year, you know, you hope, you're hope you hoping with the addition of Goldie um, and a few things, you know, Azuna having a better year and, and Carpenter staying, you know, good, staying at, at maybe his same level that we've got a chance of having a much improved offense. But you certainly don't see going in that – your pitching, your starting pitching is probably your biggest weakness right now, strangely enough. And uh, and we see a, a team, an offensive team that has the potential of being, um, you know, knocking down doors all over this division and all over this uh, league. Um, a much scarier team that I even thought we would have offensively. What do you think? Certainly. Well, it's I I definitely expected an uptick in the offense. Yeah. But really the X factor, which how ironic after the, I think it was the second episode, here I am railing on Marcelo Zuna, and he has just exploded this year. And it shows you how important that cleanup spot is in the lineup when you've got a couple of guys like Paul Goldsmith and Paul DeYoung really putting up an MVP-type season so far. It is so crucial to have that guy that can drive in runs and and hurt you with two outs, you know, or or a situation where you hit that three-run homer. And Marcel Ozuna has certainly provided that so far. 29 RBIs already on the season for Marcel. Basically 30 RBIs in 30 days. Like, that's... That is... That's a... That's hitting at a clip that you just just could never have guessed, you know? Um, Oh, definitely. He's going to try to get himself a contract. What do you think? I think he's, gonna, I think he's trying to, like, he's like, uh, yeah, last year I might have been a blip. Who's, who's going to pay me next year, you know? Um, well, he is certainly going to make some money. And maybe the most impressive thing for me so far this year for Marcel Ozuna is the walks to strikeouts. You know, you look a season ago, struggle with strikeouts. 
didn't walk very much. 14 walks to only 25 strikeouts so far this season for Marcelo Zuna. He's putting the ball in play. He's not swinging at that slider from right-handers low and away as much as he normally does. And he's allowed himself to see better pitches, and when he gets them, he's capitalized in a very big way for this offense. Yeah, and you have to assume that it's kind of the support squad that they're developing has made it to where everybody gets a chance, you know. Uh, Ozuna is it thought of as the best bat in this lineup in a, in a way, and he's, he's certainly hitting, um, other than Car- Jose Martinez, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, but other than Jose Martinez, um, who's consistently hitting like at a very high average, um, Ozuna has been, you know, the full-fledged, like, carrying the team. I mean, the level of, of batty swinging with 10 home runs in the last 30 games, I mean, he's he is the number four hitter in the almost the classical sense. Most most definitely. And you, you mentioned it, the way he profiles, you know, that big swing. He's going to hit the ball out of the ballpark when he makes contact. And, boy, when, when he squares it up, there, you see it with the exit velocity compared to the other players on the team. He has the amount of raw power that no one else on this squad does, and it's it's really been impressive to watch. And again, I don't I don't want Paul DeYoung to kind of be lost in all of this because he has been so consistent this year. And although he only has 13 RBIs, 27 runs for Paul DeYoung to lead the team so far. And he's putting pressure on on opponents in multiple ways. We've we've talked about the improved defense, but of course, sticking with the offense uh, as we as we go along here, he's stolen a couple of bags this year, and that's something that this team has done an amazing job of so far. Nineteen steals for the Cardinals, and only four steals for the opponents of the St. Louis Cardinals so far this year. Of course, we know what Yadier Molina can do in terms of controlling the run game. But we have not seen the Cardinals be able to take advantage of their own speed in running on the base pass, which is interesting because there haven't been speed guys added to this lineup. There is clearly a level of confidence and a a level of conviction when these guys are taking the extra base, whether it be going from first to third, or stealing bags this year that we have not seen previously. Well, that's actually a really amazing stat that you brought up there because, I mean, I hadn't really thought of that. When I, I mean, I noticed the difference in the aggression on the base paths, and I thought that was, um, you know, a good sign, and I, I thought it was producing positive results. I mean, I can't explain how many times I was angered by the base running over the last couple of years where people were just giving up outs left and right. Now I saw Bader get picked off first today, and that irritated me, especially when you're down three or four runs, you know. But uh, mm-hmm. but overall, the aggression on the base paths has been really positive. And then, you know, we have turned the opposing team into the Cardinals of of Mike Matheny. Do you know what I mean? Like the opposing team, <laughs> the opposing team can't take a bag anywhere. We're shutting them down, and then we're out there taking bags, um, not left and right, but we're certainly super aggressive. And like you said, we you know we didn't add somebody to the lineup just because of their wheels. We added. You know, these are all players that were going to be in the mix, and these same players are taking extra bases and stealing more bases uh, than they were before because I think, quite frankly, they're being being given the uh, green light. Well, they're being given the green light, but they're being given the green light in situations where they know they're going to be successful because it's one thing to, to know that you have the ability to steal bags like a Colton Wong. We always kind of looked at Colton Wong as a guy, hey, this guy, not only does he have kind of the power potential to maybe push 20 home runs, but this is a guy that should steal you 20 bags a season. Already off to an excellent start, six steals so far on the year for Colton Wong, and that's something that we just did not see under Mike Matheny, and I think the credit has to be given to Mike Schilt in this situation because they are clearly – doing a better job of analyzing which pitchers they can take advantage of on the mound mm-hmm. and then when they can they can give that green light in a situation where they're actually going to be successful because not only were the Cardinals a less aggressive team 
with Mike Matheny, you would think with less aggression on the base pass, you would be more efficient, right? Because you're you're deciding to pick your spots and really only go for it when it's going to work out for you. And that just didn't turn out to be the case with Mike Matheny. They were one of the least efficient teams in terms of stealing bags, taking the extra base, getting getting hung up on the base pads and being thrown out. And now we've seen a complete 180 in terms of base running really all the way around with this team under Mike Chilt. And it's just another element that the opposing team has to worry about. And it shows you that this is the kind of squad that has the potential. We, we've mentioned this previously, that they can beat you in every single way. Yeah, and um, and it's been super fun to watch. It's strange tonight to be, you know, uh, uh, talking to you after you know taking a week off, um, and then it be, it be it coming right after two losses. Uh, one that the one that was uh, Nationals loss was kind of like it almost felt like that getaway day, like just let's just get this one over with kind of feeling. You know what I mean? Um, even yeah. though even though you know certainly they, they 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 played hard, but it was just kind of that feeling of like you know okay the Nationals get one here at the end, but we pretty much dominated them all week. But then to go out of that loss into uh, into a loss today with the Cubs, where um, honestly it was just kind of one of those days because Flaherty um, was pitching well and he was getting squeezed on some strikes that Yachty literally turned around and looked at the ump like and he doesn't do that you know. So, mm-hmm. so you know, and then he gives up the three-run Jack to Rizzo. So my point being is that this team is was just, you know, if we had talked four days ago, it would have felt like they never could have lost ever again. You know what I mean? Like it was just <laughs> because they have been really uh, mashing the ball in a consistent fashion up and down the lineup. And you know, when I saw Fowler kind of turn the corner, I mean, he's hitting three twenty-one, uh, eight fifty-three OPS right now. Uh, you. You really couldn't have guessed that. And so you pop him in the center in his old stomping ground because Bader's down for a couple of days, and he just jumps on the opportunity, you know. Um, and that's not good. That's not bad for this team. I mean, honestly, uh, Fowler in the center with, with Ozuna and uh, Martinez is a very, very positive offensive lineup if, you know, if Fowler's hitting. So, uh, you know, my point being is that the team offensively looks pretty dominant to a level to to a level that I honestly I did not expect this level. I thought I thought much improved. Um, I thought that you know adding goal to the lineup would kind of sure some things up. And, uh, of, and we were always a you know pretty good offensive team. Like this was going to make us a very good offensive team, but it has the potential of being a great offensive team. Like leading the league and runs scored or, you know, top five, you know, do you, do you agree with that assessment that you think it could be one of the best lineups or do you, do you, uh, do you not see it as being as strong as maybe the Yankees or the, the Astros or some of these teams that have won a lot over the last couple of years? Well, you look at it right now and, and this team has already proven that they are, are an elite offense. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're looking, you're looking at a squad that has just, absolutely poured it on opponents at times. And then, again, we come back to the consistency, getting shut out for the first time all season today against Kyle Hendricks. You know, and I have to give the team a little bit of slack on this one because it's just a tough circumstance to go into that final game where you're looking for the sweep against the Nationals. You have some defensive miscues that really prevent you from taking that game and, and continuing that winning streak which they they probably should have won that game in retrospect and then you add on to the fact that it was supposed to be an afternoon game when you would love a getaway day when you have to travel nearly right. halfway across the country right. for that game to start around noon right. it was scheduled for a 4 p.m eastern start and then you add a two and a half hour rain delay on top of it and now it's it's just a tough situation where you have to get on the plane, turn around, get your get as many Z's as you can on on your private jet on on the way over to Chicago, mm-hmm. and then be ready to go at it at noon the next day. So, really, really a, a tough break schedule wise for the Cardinals in that situation. But 
you know, you mentioned a little bit about Dexter Fowler and in, in the offense that he's brought so far. Mm-hmm. There are some certain things, there are a couple of things that indicate that maybe he'll start to come back down to earth a little bit here. His his batting average on balls in play is extremely high right now, uh, Fowler, much higher than it's Fowler. been. Yes, yeah, okay. Fowler's, his BABIP has, has been much higher than what his so he's career numbers some good are. Luck, is what you're but saying. The, the, sorry, the thing that really stands out for me with Dexter Fowler, and you know, take this with a grain of salt because we don't have the largest sample size so far. Sure. But Dexter Fowler has been the ninth best outfielder in all of baseball in terms of defensive runs saved so far this season. You want to talk about a complete. 180 for a player from one season to the next. Dexter Fowler has turned his game around, albeit, again, in a small sample size, in almost every aspect of the game. And what a boost to the Cardinals because you, when a guy like Harrison Bader goes down, who really is a is a cornerstone player out there in center field, what he can bring to you defensively at a premium position, being a gold-glove candidate, and then you can slide a guy like Dexter Fowler in there who's still going to bring you some defense. And you mentioned it, the 853 OPS, a 421 on base percentage so far. Just really impressive stuff from Dexter Fowler. And, it, it again, this is something we've, we've talked about, a common theme, the depth of this ball club to be able to slide in a Jed Jerko who – can barely find that bats. Jed Jerko is a starter for 20 teams in Major League Baseball. Mm-hmm. This Cardinals lineup is just stacked, and it's it's hard to find your way into it the way that all these guys are going right now. There's just a lot of positives coming from every, almost every player. Matt Carpenter really is the only guy to really hit his stride yet offensively. Yeah, he's, he struggled, and, and you know what? It hasn't mattered. That's the weird part. The weird part mm-hmm. is that when with Carpenter struggling I, last year, I would have been like, "Oh no!" We, and we'd have seen we'd have seen it on the score, scoreboard that we we wouldn't have had any runs, you know. And so, yeah. so uh, th- this year, you know, um, and let's face it, that's that is because Paul DeYoung is he's hitting like a a, a KG veteran at this point. He he is his strike zone is. Um, very clearly improved. His strike recognition is really improved. And when you talk about depth, and that's your that's a day to day expected player, but he's 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 improved offensively. Period. But then you go to Jose Martinez as your fourth outfielder, <laughs> and and a guy that you're paying a million and a half bucks or something in that category. And you look at his splits over the last thirty days, or even. Um, seven games. Let's see. They are last thirty games. He's hitting three seventy um, with a f- uh, four eighty one slug. But in the last seven games, he's hitting four seventy four with a f- with a five forty five on base percentage and a six thirty two slug. Um, like, I mean, those those are just outrageous numbers, and you you really kind of think about it moving forward for this team certainly a team that's already put themselves in in a position to be in contention moving forward you know the saying is you can't win the division in april but you can lose it in april and this team has certainly put themselves where they want to be moving forward and with that depth in the outfield, a guy like Jose Martinez, you mentioned your fourth outfielder is a top 10 hitter in all of baseball. That is a very intriguing trade chip to have. And I would say even a Tyler O'Neill is a guy that could be potentially moved as someone that, you know, it's kind of worrisome for the Cardinals, such a promising young player to see him get such little reps. Mm-hmm. Maybe another team is willing to take a chance on him, and you can go out and, and get that extra arm that you think you might need. Get that whatever whatever needs might arise as the season moves along, because we we know for a fact injuries will happen. You know we don't right. want to wish that upon anyone. You know especially for the Cardinals, really for any team. But 
it's something that that happens. Attrition is is going to take place over such a long grind of a season, and the Cardinals not only have the depth to begin with, they have depth to be able to go out and fill needs moving forward as well. Right, um, and so when you base, you know, think you now, I would say that you could you have five starting outfielders, right, and you have to decide which three are going to play each day. But there's a very good chance that every single outfielder on that bench or in, that, that are playing that day could start for a, a lot of teams in the league. So, so you do have that piece that you could maybe move. Now, my concern with any move movement of outfielders is that Ozuna is not going to be able to sign here after the year. You know, um, that no matter what kind of year Ozuna has, that he's not coming back because he's a going to be asking for more money than we're willing to give, or b his 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 year doesn't turn out to be so great, and then you don't want him. So it's like a catch twenty two with Ozuna, right? So I mean, do you right. do you see a method the, by which the uh, Ozuna stays on the Cardinals? Well, you know, I would imagine that it would have to be an extension talk that gets going very soon. And considering that he's a Scott Boris client, he's not going to take. I it. just, I just don't see that happening. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about a guy whose agent is the same agent as Dallas Keuchel, who is. Of a proven pitcher, Cy Young contender that still does does not have a job this year. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's a uh, it's a really a huge conundrum when you when you think about Marcelo Zuna moving forward. And you know, of course, if you have the crystal ball and you're able to look into the future and see how productive he is, wow, it might have been a great idea to try to buy low last year in the offseason, right? But with so many question marks, especially with the shoulder and the health issues, it's it's something that, you know, well, that's, that's rightfully why, so, the Cardinals shied away from. That's why I don't move a Tyler O'Neill. I mean, in the end. Um, because I believe that Tyler, Tyler O'Neill will be playing left field for the Cardinals next year. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I... And I and so that moving one of those pieces, I, you know, we've got we we do still have a few a few guys down in AAA that are pretty damn good outfielders too. So I guess you could move a piece because you know somebody like O'Neill is marketable for his power. I mean, he's got raw, um, huge power. You know, so so I don't know. We'll have to see how that unfolds. Um, I think that you know we talked uh, when we talked last. Um, well, we talked about two things, you know, in the podcast that have kind of come to fruition and the idea that, you know, these outfielders and what their performance was going to really affect how the offense started this season. And it's come to pass that the outfield has kind of um, been just surprisingly uh, productive. Like, you know, not, you know, I don't want to sound too surprised, but honestly, I didn't see this level of success out of Fowler or Ozuna, period. I mean, how well, you, it's you know? it's one of those things where you know you you certainly had cold feet as a Cardinals fan and tempered yeah. expectations, considering that was all the talk going into last year was, wow, you add Marcelo Zuna mm-hmm. and you have Tommy Pham out there and Sire and Dexter right. Fowler who had a really good 2017. This is maybe the best offensive outfield in all of baseball, mm-hmm. and it turned out to be a wild disappointment last year and now we're really seeing what everyone thought this outfield could have been last year this year and as you talked about it has certainly been the fuel to to the success of of the offense as a whole and you know just up and down the lineup you know other than other than Matt Carpenter Everyone is performing. I mean, you look, you look at a guy like Colton Wong, you know, his, the average has dropped off a little bit since the beginning of the year. You know, he got off to that really hot start, but 17 walks for Colton Wong. He's got a 384 on base right now, and that is just something that is incredibly productive. And really, when you look at it, in, adding the six steals to go along with that, that is all icing on the cake for a guy who's a gold glover up the middle, you know, and all of a sudden you're talking about a team that, you know, over the Mike Matheny era, just so many defensive woes for this squad. And now it, it seems like, 
how many players have I mentioned so far in this episode that are Gold Glove <laughs> candidates? You've got a Colton Long, a Paul DeYoung, a uh, Harrison Bader, Goldsmith. you know, Paul Goldsmith yeah. at first base. You you got Gold Glove got caliber Jose, defenders Jose all over the field, littering the the outfield and infield. And then let's not forget about one of the greatest defensive catchers of all time, Yadier Molina, behind the plate. Yeah. You know, it's really an embarrassment of riches all the way around. And if if the pitching can can pick it up from the starters end of, end of things, the the bullpen has been act absolutely wonderful. If the starters can start getting a few more innings, be a little bit more consistent, you're talking about a team that really has the balance and the ability to hurt you in so many different ways that you see from World Series contenders. Yeah, and, and don't forget Jose Martinez is one of the best defenders in the league. Don't forget that, Colin. He, he <laughs> 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 so, so when I see him going after a ball, I saw him going after one today where he like was looking for the wall out of the corner of his eye, and he was like really slow to go down the right field line. So yeah, I mean, it, other than the fact that we've got a you know we've got a left fielder who can't throw, and a right fielder, <laughs> the right fielder who is just in the lineup for his bat, and God bless him, never take him out of the lineup again. Uh, we have you know in that heart of that team that up the middle, we have a hell of a defensive club because uh, you know DeYoung, I'm telling you, man, his level at shortstop. Again, that's another one that's exceeded my expectations at short. I mean, he's making plays. He had a diving stop the other day that was just downright nasty. And uh, and so, yeah, up the middle, man, we're solid. And that's why it's crazy because I want to see Bader out there every night. You know what I mean? But when, but when a Fowler's going good, you really can't do that, honestly. Fowler is a wise veteran um, that can hit. You know, I mean, he can, he's a professional hitter if he's right, you know. So, I don't know. I think the bait, I think the Bader Fowler thing is going to be something that's going to have to work itself out. And I don't know how it does exactly. Um, you know, what, well, in, in my opinion, you know, as, as hard as this is to say, as well as Jose Martinez is going, I think you have to keep Bader out there in center field. Just some of the things that I've seen this year as opposed to last year, you know, you saw a guy that, you know, he walked at a decent rate last year, but this year he has really turned it on to another level. Granted, he only has 56 at-bats so far this year. A 384 on base percentage, you know the power potential is there for a guy like Harrison Bader, and when he starts putting the bat on the ball, he's going to be able to put some over the fence. And then, you know, just... In terms of outfielders, he is far and away the best option you have defensively in at a premium position again in center field. I think that's something that you just you can't mess with. I think There's no doubt budding, about that, yeah. I think he is a budding star, you know, much like we saw Paul DeYoung kind of slowly moving his way up and you see that consistent upward trend. Yeah. I see a lot of the same thing in Harrison Bader and I would hate the kind of stymie that that progression by putting a guy in Dexter Fowler out there because he's hot right now, you know, and that's not to say that Harrison Vader, you know, shouldn't be benched every four or five games for a guy like Fowler if he is still going hot, but I think in right field, that's where Fowler and Martinez are going to have to battle for the playing time because... Harrison Bader, really just the potential is so much higher than both of those guys because of his ability to be that complete player. Right. And, you know, when you look at his numbers and you see 384 on base and you see 807 OPS and you know that his ability, his ability to create uh, danger to, to do dangerous things in the Cardinals' favor on the ba- base paths because he really – he hasn't stolen a bunch of bases this year, but uh, like you said, he's a zero. Yeah. Zero, actually, and that's what's so surprising. The Cardinals have been so efficient stealing bags. He is 0 for 3 so far, and I can guarantee you something right now, Josh. 
that will not continue. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him in that rundown today, and they were, you could see that he, I thought he might get out of it because they couldn't catch him. Once he turned and turned on the Jets, they had to get rid of the ball. So, um, yeah, so we're going to see some stolen bases. But, yeah, so so he's his numbers are good enough to where you wouldn't even question putting him in there. But then you look at Fowler hitting 321, uh, 421 on base, 853 OPS, and you got to go, okay, we got to get him out there. And then you see Martin, I mean, T- Martinez hitting 361, like, you know, basically, uh, you know, flirting with the idea of a batting title if you leave him in there all year, you know? Like, um, I mean, how, uh, the decision is very, very difficult. I think, I think, I, but I think it's one of those decisions that you're glad you have to make, you know? Uh, exactly. In the short term, you can just try to keep people happy any way you know how, you know? On the short term, you can just, you know, bat, you know, start Bader against every lefty and give, uh, you know, Fowler, because Fowler got sick the other day, so that got Bader another chance, and Bader took advantage of that. Bader got hurt, Fowler took advantage of that, which is, it's it's really good sign. And so you just don't want anybody getting so frustrated that it starts to really have a negative impact on the uh, clubhouse, but... Um, I don't see that with this team right now. I mean, it, they seem to get along very, very well. Well, you know, and the thing that any any professional athlete will tell you is that winning cures everything. You know, and you talk about too what a what a great problem to have that you have four outfielders producing at an elite level, and you have to choose between which one you want to play. This time last year. We were talking about, but can we find one outfielder that will give us the level of production that merits keeping them in the lineup every single day? And the turnaround is just unbelievable. And you look at it from an organizational standpoint, it's, it's really just kind of a, a different feel under Mike Schilt with this team that guys – seem so much more confident. They seem ready to step in and and fill the role that they are made to play, and they know their role. I think that is the biggest thing compared to the Mike Matheny-led Cardinals to the Mike Schilt-led Cardinals, that Mike Matheny was given a 25-man roster that might as well have been a 20-man roster unless it was getaway day or it was a blowout, you know? Mm -hmm. And instead, with Mike Schilt, all of these guys are getting utilized. Even a guy like Tyler O'Neill, we talk about those four outfielders producing at an elite level. Tyler O'Neill has gotten into 20-plus games still so far this year. So he knows his number is going to be called, and he's ready to step up when that moment arrives. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to keep everyone engaged, you know? Just from the from any kind of way you look at it, you know, the defense benefits so much from a pitcher that's going to work quicker and keep everyone engaged. And I think that's kind of the same concept that you're seeing with Mike Schilt. Is he's keeping everyone on this team engaged, and they're starting to develop an identity. You know, certainly you see the identity in in the in the bullpen, some great personalities out there calling themselves the jungle out there in the bullpen. And, you know, it's just, it's fun to watch. And you can tell that the players are having fun. And, again, winning cures everything. And the chemistry looks great. And everyone is very happy when you're winning. But it makes you wonder what comes first, the chicken or the egg, because... It's all clicking on all cylinders for this team, even despite these last two losses. I think uh, not many signs of discouragement, even in those couple of losses. Okay, yeah, I agree, and um, I'm very, you know, again, we're both pretty damn happy about where this team is, uh, which, you know, which makes me uncomfortable. To, to be happy <laughs> to be happy on May 1st or May 2nd like I guess it's May 3rd yeah uh, to, to be happy at this early in the season is is scary you know like it feels like something bad's about to happen um, and I, I want to point out something that I I just don't like Anthony Rizzo uh, I'm just gonna just lay that out there of, of the players I despise in this league Anthony Rizzo is one of them and there really is no reason to. Right? 
pre pretty nice guy overall, but the way he crowds that plate and the, the and the kind of kind of pompous attitude he has when he steps to the plate, and then he hit that three run bomb today. I mean, I mean, Fl Flaherty was getting everybody out, and uh, but he could not get Rizzo out, and uh, and so yeah, I'm just gonna continue to despise Anthony Rizzo at the same level that I I kind of despise Ryan Braun too. These are two players that I just for some reason have never liked the way they look, run, throw, hit, anything. I just I just hate them with a passion <laughs> as baseball players, of course. But uh um but but Flaherty, let's let's talk about that. Flaherty looked pretty damn good today and I think that he looks pretty damn good most of the time, but is he good enough to be the dominant pitcher we need cuz Michaelis is starting to turn the corner, you know? But we've got Flaherty, Michaelis, Waka, Hudson. They're all hovering in the mid mid fours in their on their ERA. You know, they're all hovering uh, 1.25 to 1.5 WHIP. You know, they're they're good, but they're not dominant. Well, certainly those guys haven't been dominant. But again, I think you have to kind of temper those numbers against. Look at look at the matchups that that the Cardinals have had so far. They have gone against some potent offenses, mm -hmm. and to play so many games in Miller Park, yeah. playing at Wrigley Field is is a big time offensive ballpark. You had those couple of games in in Mexico where the ball flies, you know, and yeah. even Washington is a hitter's ballpark. So a lot of tough matchups, and so far. They've at least held their own, and they've given they've given the team a chance, and that's all you have to do with this offense. You don't have to go out there and pitch eight scoreless every time out if you're the if you're a starter for the Cardinals. Mm -hmm. Now, what you do have to do as one of the Cardinal pitchers is avoid walks and attack hitters, attack hitters, and do not let yourself kind of be afraid of of giving up that gopher ball, which the Cardinals have given up plenty of home runs yeah. so far this year, and I think you'll start to see that level out and kind of regress back to the mean, but this is, this is a pitching staff that, to me, has done still a pretty good job, and the one guy that you left out of the rotation there, Adam Wainwright, well, I was going to talk been about him. Been He's got the best ERA in the staff. <laughs> he has been sensational yeah, this year. You're talking about to Michael see, Michael to see Walker. The pinpoint control has been amazing from him. Yeah, you're talking about Michael Walker, the king of the walk and the gopher ball. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, um, Wainwright has been uh, the best pitcher the Cardinals have so far in terms of consistency. He's out there every five days, and he's given him a chance to win. And uh, he's he's trying to get through six innings. <clears throat> I think he's averaging a, a little over five. Um, and so, and you know, I I like where Michaelis is too because I, I can tell that he's going to give you innings. He's going to eat innings. You know, I'm more, I guess I'm more worried about the younger guys and Michael Waka. Well, certainly, you know, and, and you had, you posed the question about Jack Flaherty, and it really it's just a matter of throwing strikes with that guy and trusting his stuff because he is absolutely electric. Everyone knows it. And you mentioned him getting pinched a little bit that fast in his start today. today against the Cubs. But regardless of that, you know, even say it's, say it's five or six pitches that could have gone his way and been strikes, 60 per, a 60 percent strike rate, which is what he had in this ball game, 66 strikes on 110 total pitches. That's just not going to get it done. That number has to be north of 70 percent, or hitters aren't going to swing at pitches out of the zone. They're expecting you to throw pitches out of the zone, and I think you have to give the Cubs credit against Jack Flaherty because they did their homework and they they knew that this is a guy that wants to get you to chase on that slider. Sometimes he can struggle getting that fastball exactly where he wants it in the zone, and they really made him work. And, you know, it's it's one of those things. That's a, that's a good lineup for the Chicago Cubs. Very and, good. you know, it seems like the Cardinals are just going to win every single game when you're winning 10 out of 11. Right. But it's just simply not the truth, you know. And you have to take a little bit of the bad with the good sometimes. 
And, you know, those kind of starts are going to happen. Even even giving up three earned runs in in five and two-thirds, hey, that's that's the kind of line that's been translating the win so far for the Cardinals. You got shut out for the first time this season. It's going to happen at some point. Yeah. And you just move on from it and, and bounce back tomorrow with a win. Well, that was a freakish, freakish start from Hendricks today. I mean, 81 pitches, complete game, uh, through like 90% strikes. And his, I mean, we talked about him very early in, in the show, like I think first episode when we were kind of running down the division that, you know, we were talking about the Cubs pitching staff. And he's just, his stuff is just, it's it's nasty in terms of it's never straight. You never know where that ball is going to be when, when it's time to swing at it, you know. And so uh, today he was... He was throwing that wiffle ball up there, um, um, like he's known to do. So, and, and he just got a fifty-five million dollar extension, I think. So, H- Hendricks is a—he uh, uh, just—he just—he outgunned him today, pure and sim- simple. He had a fantastic start, and uh, and he was basically unhittable for the most part. Um, so. Uh, you know, and I, I didn't mention this to you, but, um, you know, I, I, I sat 12th row behind the Cardinals dugout for, for a game in the, that, uh, Milwaukee Brewery series where we swept them four games, right? Four. Yeah. And, uh, three, 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 I'm sorry, three games. Uh, I was at the middle game in there and, uh, it, it didn't look like the, the games we'd saw at Miller Park. It looked, um, it, the Cardinals looked like the dominant team. And we were those days, but I mean, literally, we looked better than the Brewers. And I had made a comment about maybe the Brewers being the best team in the division. I think that the Cardinals got every bit the firepower, if not more. And I think we do have the better pitching staff for the long run, especially now that this bullpen has started coming together. And Schilt, unlike some people we used to have managing the Cardinals, uh, he doesn't go to his guy. He goes to the guy who's getting the job done. So Brebia, the discussion of whether Brebia was going to be a key part of this bullpen is no longer a discussion because he gets everybody out and he gets now he's getting the ball when it's time for him to get the ball. Well, it's it's an incredible what this bullpen has done so mm-hmm. far. And really, when you talk about the difference between the Cardinals and Brewers, certainly I would give the Cardinals a little bit of an edge with their starting staff over the Brewers, but not by much. There's some nice young pitchers on that Brewers staff. I think they get undersold a little bit sometimes, but there has certainly been a huge step back for that Brewers bullpen this year compared to what it was last year, and now you're starting to see the Cardinals bullpen hit their stride. Andrew Miller is finding himself again. He had a rough spring, a tough start to the year as well Mm -hmm. he's starting to get it back and jordan hicks that slider has been elevated to the next level that game that you were at he struggled a little bit had a walk gave up one run still got the save but the variation in the slider is what really stands out to me yeah yelich got to the plate in that one (laughs) sweeper or he can dip it at that back foot of the lefty like you're talking about to yelich that is just absolutely disgusting, the depth he gets on that pitch. And then consider that you have to be worried about 102 miles an hour bearing in on your hands as a righty oh, yeah, or yeah. as a lefty there's, just flying there's out of no the prayer. zone on you. And it's it's a lot to think about as a hitter, and you got to make your decision quick because even that slider is coming in there at 92, 93. you got no prayer. I'm sorry. If he, if he can locate that slider, there you don't have a chance. Because there is no way, because once he gets you to two strikes, if he can throw that slider just outside, just low and away and just outside the zone, he's going to get you out. There is no hitting that. So so he's going to be a dominant, uh, dominant closer if he can make that pitch. If when they're sitting dead red fastball, he snaps off a slider, um, you're going to see guys uh, swinging the bat like literally it's going to fall out of their hands like they're going to just drop it you know cuz it's just it's the stuff is just too nasty and like you said if miller comes into form uh we have and you go brebia miller hicks that is that's lights out you know and and well, then, don't forget about john ganton there no, all he's I do, done yeah. had a point five in .9 ERA in 20 innings pitched 
the most inning pit, innings pitched out of the bullpen, you've got a ton of guys that you can turn to as weapons out of the pen to attack hitters and really strike fear into the opposing team. There's There are so many more options. You know, this isn't the kind of team where you're going to – go to Matt Bowman in the bullpen throwing 91 and expect him to throw the most innings pitched out of your bullpen. you got a guy in John Gant who's firing in 97-mile-an-hour sinkers. Yeah. And then Jordan Hicks and John Brevia, we already mentioned. Mm-hmm. Andrew Miller. And, you know, Dominic Leone, he's had a couple of blow-up appearances. But other than that, you know, he looks like he's going to be a really good option. And then when one of those guys go down, slide in Orion Helsley. I mean, a guy that can hit triple digits and really was somebody that last year would have contributed had he not gotten injured. And you're looking at a bullpen that not only do they have the the top end shutdown guys, even even the kind of lower guys on the depth chart in that bullpen are really going to give you good innings, and they're. There just isn't a weakness in that bullpen, and there's enough firepower that even if you know Hicks is unavailable for a game or Miller's unavailable, you have really good options that you can go to and get outs when you really need them in clutch situations. And if you really, really want to shut down the other team, you bring in Jed Jorko to to throw a 68 mile an hour fastball uh just blaze it past the cincinnati reds while the cardinals are down by 12 runs or whatever the score was that's the guy you need in your bullpen jed jerko because we were concerned about getting him at bats we don't need to get him at bats because he's a pitcher now and uh so he'll be moving into the probably the starting rotation soon um no, but I, well, I you know he's he's got he you know he's at a pace of twenty seven strikeouts per nine innings. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think he can be any better than that. I think that's a really good start. I think that it's strange that when you throw a sixty eight mile an hour pitch, that you do have to explain that it is a changeup, as opposed to people just knowing <laughs> it's a changeup. But uh, but um, yeah, that that sixty eight mile an hour changeup uh, basically proved that uh, everybody else needs to stand aside. It's Jed Jericho's bullpen. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think what what we're both going to agree on here is that you even if you get past the first layer, and that's what I was going to kind of allude to. You know, in bullpens, you've got your A team and you got your B team. You got your A team for a game that you're up three to two, and you've got your pitcher through your starting pitcher through six. Now you got the seven, the eight, and the nine, and you got to go with your A team to get you through three scoreless innings with a one run, one run lead, right? But then you also have your pitchers that you need on those nights when you're down three or you're up six or um, or it's all hands on deck because the starter didn't go lo- long enough, right? And so the question will be whether some of these more role-oriented, almost B-team uh, uh, relievers can you know, eat those innings on important nights because if they do... That's when your depth can get you the wins that you didn't expect to win, meaning you're down three, they hold down the fort, right? And you come back and get the victory. But if they, because if they keep giving up runs, the deficit never gets closed. And, you know, so it's what I'm seeing is a bullpen that, pro, that can keep the game competitive every night, uh, mostly because there's a, there's a pitcher by the name of Brett Cecil that's not, no longer out there. Um, that would be an example of somebody that I am glad I don't have to watch pitch anymore, or I don't know how long it's going to be, but I'll, I'll accept whatever it is. You know, uh, I don't, honestly, I don't know if he's hurt his thumb, his pitching shoulder, or just his, he's emotionally hurting, but he just, he just never really came together for the Cardinals, you know? And so I see so many bright faces and bright opportunities for these young relievers, that I just hope that they stick with the kind of guys that they're that they've been bringing up and working with, you know. Um, do you do you know uh, any idea whether uh, Myers is what his health is like? Have you heard anything on that? Um, you know, I have not looked. I can check it right yeah, now. Too, but you, you mentioned some of those some of those B team guys. I was going to mention Myers, you know, but mm-hmm. not up on the on the major league team Let's right see. now. Placed Giovanni on ten day list. Twenty strikeouts in eleven point two innings yeah. in a in a 
in a three eight six ERA. I mean, it, when that's the the back end of your bullpen, or you know, one of those guys that you're not heavily relying on, that really goes to show you the amount of depth that this that this team has, and it's just impressive, you know. Okay, Myers. Myers unlikely to return until the All Star break. So, yeah. So it looks like Gallegos is uh, is going to be there for a while. I guess we'll probably see a little bit of Ponce de Leon as well. Um, what do you think? How, how do you see us filling that out? Do you think Gallegos stays up? He's been pitching extremely well. So I mean, I don't see why not. Well, uh, you know, I mean, you went out there and traded for him for a reason I would like to think you know but mm-hmm. then again you also traded for Jason Shreve who is no longer on the major league roster and no one even wanted him he cleared waivers you yeah, know you, but you gave a guy in, in Giovanni Gallegos <laughs> is giving you solid innings and that's kind of what it comes down to is you need guys that can at least give you innings and the difference is there are so many more key relievers that that are filling up so many more innings you don't need as many of those those B team relievers. I mean, let's let's list off some of these A team relievers: John Gant, mm-hmm. John Brebbia, mm-hmm. Dominic Leone, Jordan Hicks, Andrew Miller, Ryan Hells. That's six guys right there. Right. If you if you add in Ryan Helsley, and you know, there's really only room for maybe one or two B team relievers out there, and. That way you preserve them, and they get put in spots where they're not, you know, overtaxed, and they can really kind of shine, which is what Geo Gallegos has shown so far. Right. I mean, when I say A and B team, though, what I'm really alluding to is not the level of the pitcher. It's just that on some nights when you're going to go to your best three, what what are those three names right now? And, you know... I I think you're saying, well, you could pull them out of the hat because anybody you put out there is going to be able to do the job. But, you know, like in the seventh inning, if both are rested, do you go to Brebby or Gant? Who's your seventh inning guy? Uh, You can say either, but you got to make that choice. Your eighth inning guy, do you go to Miller? Do you, you know, depending on matchup, right? And then, you know, that's that's the thing, you know. I think that's the beauty of the way that this bullpen is set up right now with so many guys that you can go to and actually trust. There really isn't a seventh inning guy. There really isn't an eighth inning guy. It is matchup based, as you mentioned. And you know, if you got three righties come up, coming up, put John Brevy out there. Mm-hmm. If there's a situation where maybe you could use multiple innings, or you know, the pitcher isn't coming up at the end of this inning, but you know they're going to make it up by the end of the next inning, yeah. put John Gant out there. Right. You know, there's a lot of different options and a lot of different ways to to go with it. And, you know, you got a couple of lefties coming up, put in Andrew Miller. You know, it's it's really an excellent situation for this team to have. And, you know, I you see the game of baseball moving away from, you know, having that designated seventh inning guy, designated eighth inning guy. And the Cardinals certainly fit that mold right now. And I think the bullpen has been the most encouraging part about this team because if there's anything that the postseason has taught us over the past four or five years, that bullpen is what really can be the X factor for your team moving forward. There's two really, well, I'll say three big, big factors that you see about all of the World Series champs and all of the World Series contenders recently. The, the first one is something that we've all known top end of the rotation do you have that ace or the couple of guys that can that can be aces that can really carry you in the postseason do you have a dominant offense which i think this team certainly has Mm -hmm. and do you have that dominant shut down bullpen you need three plus guys that you can count on late in the game to go to that you know are going to be able to fire in strikes and really be efficient with the way that they go out there. I think the Cardinals certainly have the last two. Maybe the one question mark is the the ace at the top of the staff. You know, I really like Miles Michaelis a lot. I'm not willing to call him an ace in the way that, you know, I guess technically you could say that there are 
30 aces, you know, or 31 aces out there uh, based on the amount of teams. But in all reality, there's maybe like, what, 15 to 10 guys that are, that are real aces. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure that this team necessarily has it. I think Jack Flaherty can potentially be one of those guys. Mm-hmm. And, you know, after the rough start for Dakota Hudson, I think there are some very promising things that I've seen from Dakota Hudson. And, again, mentioned it a little bit previously, getting shifted into the bullpen and then having to come back and be a starter. Really, that's a that's a tough thing for a sinker baller like, like Dakota Hudson because he relies so much on feel and just listening to his post game from that final game of the Washington series, he said it himself that it really is a matter of, of routine and getting into the groove of it because it's it's almost like a golfer, you know, you have to feel out what's what's your swing like on that day and then you have to make the adjustments moving forward. Well that's how it is for a Dakota Hudson and the more that he can get in that groove of having that same routine, there's less guesswork less adjustments for him to have to make out on the mound. And, you know, somebody who's just getting used to the major league game, that's a huge advantage for a guy to take that extra one or two thoughts out of his head of, oh, how do I adjust to get myself right? And now he can focus more specifically on those hitters in the matchup and what he wants to do with that matchup rather than having to worry about, how do I get my sinker in the zone? How do I get it where I want it to go? I think you're starting to see him put the ball in the spots where he wants to, and certainly the stuff is there with him. He he can be a huge part of this team moving forward. Absolutely, and you know, watching him pitch, you know, really starting to see that's that's a really cool thing about uh, you know Major League Baseball in the sense that. You know, pitcher goes every five days, and if you're if you're a fan, if you really watch the games, you start to really get a, a feeling for that pitcher. You know, uh, like you know, w- with Flaherty, we know what we're gonna we're gonna get that hard nosed like attack kind of vibe when he's out there, and uh, and that's fun to watch. Um, with with Hudson though, you see a guy who um, who knows how to pitch. Like he knows he's a thinking pitcher, even though his stuff is nasty. Um, there's tons of sink on that on his sinker, you know. It's just it's his stuff is nasty, but you can also see that he learns from his mistakes, and you start to get a feel for a guy that that honestly uh, you can see is uh, he gets irritated when he's not pitching well. And that might be the youth, you know. I mean, no pitcher likes to get hit, but but you know, some, there's some pitchers that it doesn't get to at all, and he gets a little upset, but. But he's a, he's a thinking man's pitcher. He is um, he is adjusting. He's coming out for the next start with lessons learned from the the last start. And um, I'm seeing a guy that not only has the potential of being a very good starter, but has the potential of being a starter a good starter for a long time. You know, he doesn't have that. He doesn't seem to have that kind of burnout factor that some some young pitchers have, to where you just don't know if they're going to make it very long. You know, uh, he seems like he's got the potential of being a pitcher in this league for quite some time. Well, most certainly. And then the thing that you have to really keep in mind, too, you got Yadier Molina behind the plate guiding these guys along, and they are going to learn things that other pitchers will never learn over their entire career because they have had the the privilege and opportunity to work with one of the greatest catchers. You know, we talk about Molina's defensive ability, but really the biggest thing is the way that he handles the pitching staff. You know, the numbers, there's no secret. This team has almost a full run less ERA, catchers ERA-wise when Yadier Molina is behind the plate as opposed to anyone else. And what he can do for guiding you through a lineup and giving you confidence as a pitcher that you know you're going to be on the same page because – Whatever page Yadier Molina is on is the right page. You don't have to guess. Mm -hmm. It's a huge, huge booster for especially these younger guys and their longevity in the league. You know, these are lessons that not only will it help you in your next start, but that will help you grow and maintain that consistency over a long period of time. And, you know, the Cardinals are just extremely fortunate to have a guy like Yadier Molina and what he means to this team 
can never be understated. You know, there's a lot of other storylines going on this year, but never forget how much Yadier Molina means to this team and what he does for this pitching staff. Well, I think it's going to be a very much a negative feeling on the day that Yadi is no longer a Cardinal. I just, honestly, that's the one that's going to hurt because I just don't know how you replace that. Like you don't, you know, uh, you know, Pujols has moved on, and 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 I didn't know how we were going to replace that. And I guess that's another example of somebody you don't replace. But but Yadi even even is a different kind of thing. He's the kind of thing that you don't even know how to measure it exactly. You know, uh, Pujols, is, uh, his, his stats tell you the story. A great, great hitter, you know, uh, all-time great hitter, uh, just a great ball player. But Yachty is almost like a coach. He's like a, a friend. He's like a, he's like a uh, you know, perfect teammate. He's like loyal. He's like all about the birds and the bats. So he's really just been an uh, exceptional part of this franchise. And, and just to think about the amount of pitchers that he's brought up and schooled and, 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 and led them through their careers, you know. I mean, him and Wainwright, for God's sakes, um, they're, they're the last of the old guard, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, think about the way that we measure superstars across all sports. I think the one common theme that you come back to when we talk about what makes somebody a superstar, which is funny because no one mentions the, the name Yadier Molina when talking about a superstar when you turn on MLB Network, when you watch ESPN, whatever it may be, Fox Sports, whatever you turn on. Yadier Molina elevates everyone else's play around him so much. Look at what Magic Johnson did in terms of elevating players around him. Look at what LeBron James does in terms of elevating players around him. Look at what Tom Brady does in terms of elevating players around him. You see that same exact thing with Yadier Molina, and it's something that I think is really easy to kind of forget about in a game of of baseball that, you know, I find it kind of ironic that it's such the numbers game, you know, and everyone's got it figured out analytically with the sabermetrics and it's ahead of all the other sports. You said it perfectly. You cannot measure how valuable Yadier Molina is. And it just absolutely blows my mind when I hear people try to make an argument that Yadier Molina is not a Hall of Famer. And, yes, I'm talking about you, Brian Kenny, out here looking at, oh, well, here's what his war is, you know, and look at, look at his offensive production. It's just so much lower than any other Hall of Famer. Well, you know, for being a stats nerd, have you ever thought to think, Maybe you're not looking at the full picture when it comes to this guy because, you know, so much emphasis has been placed on run prevention in the game of baseball. You know, defensive runs saved a really common thing that you start hearing about lately. Well, they still haven't figured out how to, fact, how to factor catcher's ERA into that equation because if they if they were able to do that, Yadier Molina would come up near the top of the list in how valuable players are year in and year out. And I will stick by that with, with every conviction that I have because I've seen it with my own eyes. And the numbers bear it out, too. It's, it's just a matter of them trying to figure out how do you quantify it? How do you mix it in to these, these other sabermetric stats like war? Because certainly it's not accounting for that. And Yadier Molina is absolutely a Hall of Famer, and I will go so far as to say one of the five greatest catchers to ever play the game of baseball. Yadier Molina is a superstar in the game of baseball. And a Hall of Famer. And the reason he is a Hall of Famer, no doubt, is, yes, some of it's qualitative reasoning, right? Instead of just straight-up quantitative uh, numbers mm-hmm. game. Um, you know, I think of a guy like Pudge Rodriguez as kind of a, a comparable uh, player with, you know, Pudge had some, some big offensive years, right? But Pudge moved oh, around. He was, he was and, a heck of a hitter. Yeah, Pudge moved around and Pudge, uh, uh, I was, I don't think was as good a defensive catcher as 
Yadier Molina has been for this long of a period of time. Um, and so for me, Yadier Molina is the best defensive catcher to ever play baseball. And I think that's what gets you into the Hall of Fame. If you're the best defensive catcher of all time, I'm sorry. Put that right on the plaque and, and put it in the hall, you know. This guy was the best defensive catcher to ever play baseball. I think that gets you, you know. The, he, what catcher is the, has ever been the best hitter on their team, except for maybe like a Mike Piazza had some years where he was in that zone, and Johnny Bench had some great years. Um, but, but yeah. Um, Yogi yeah. Berra. Yogi Berra, great. But, I mean, they were always on teams where the other guys were better hitters than them. I mean, Yogi Berra is an excellent That's hitter. True. But, I mean, he was, he was, you know, playing with Mickey Mantle and, uh, yep. he's, you know, playing with some of the greatest hitters to ever touch t- touch a baseball. So, so yeah. So Yadi, uh, Yadi's a Hall of Famer. So we don't even need, we don't never need to have this discussion on this show. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, talk about players that, and we'll we'll get ready to to close up shop here. But uh, talk about players that are uplifting their team. We're about to play two more with the Cubs, which I'm pretty excited to watch over the next couple of days. And then we're on to play the Phillies. Um, We'll get a, a taste of the new Phillies, who are now leading the NL East um, with their Bryce Harper superstar signing. Um, it seems to me that he might be uplifting that team a little bit, you know, and you know, the, taking them to a new place. I mean, do you give do you give Harper a, a lion's share of the credit in terms of what the Phillies are doing, or do you think it's the fact that they improved the team overall? Uh, I I certainly think you have to give the the front office credit yeah. in terms of what the Phillies have done so far. Andrew McCutcheon has been excellent so far this year. Three eighty two on base, four sixty slug. Reese Hoskins, four oh nine on base, six oh two slug. That's good for over a thousand slugging for, or OPS. And really, you've been a lot play, better player. Then Bryce Harper has been so far this year. Mm-hmm. You look at JT Real Muto, who some people consider the best catcher in the game, which, you know, after our discussion about Yadier <laughs> Molina, I will respectfully disagree with that. <laughs> but certainly some numbers backing that case up. Yeah. This is, in, you know, don't forget Gene Segura in there too, hitting 338, 500 slugging percentage. It is a potent offensive team. They've got some nice young pitching to mix in there as well. And, you know, something that, that I've really noticed so far about the Cardinals' schedule is that when they play teams that they're better than, they've, they've won the series, and they've held their own, if not owned teams, that you expect to be contenders for their division and possibly the World Series as well. You know, it's it's been fun to see – this high level of competition and see the Cardinals measure themselves against these good teams. They played so many games against the Brewers so far. Mm -hmm. Now they're in this series against the Cubs. Mm -hmm. They've swept the Dodgers. The Padres certainly look better so far this year. Mm -hmm. They have a winning record that really the, the NL West has been a little bit of a surprise in general, in my opinion. But then, you know, you talk about playing the Phillies, yeah. They'll have the Pirates, Pirates dropped off after a really hot start. Yeah. And then you go on the road against Atlanta after that, and that's a team that won their division last year. So it's been it's been a lot of fun, a tough schedule to start the year. But yeah. the Cardinals have been up to task, and it's made for really entertaining baseball. It has. And, yeah, I, I think we're going to see something over this next three weeks because we're running into teams that are kind of struggling. Braves are still struggling, kind of limping along. Rangers are limping along. Pirates are kind of falling back into the zone that they maybe should be the Royals and the Braves again. Um, so once we get done with the Cubs and the Phillies here, we might see whether the Cardinals can run off uh, a bunch of wins against teams that still haven't found their, their legs yet. So we'll have to see. Um, well, let's get let's wrap up this episode of Birds on the Wire podcast. Um, we'll probably run into you folks probably about a week from today when we – when we get through the Phillies and the Pirates series, and we'll talk to you again um, for the Birds on the Wire podcast. Got anything to say, Callan? Just that I've enjoyed it, as always, Josh. Uh, a lot of fun things to talk about, you know, a little bit of a, a action-packed episode after missing last week. Yeah, But uh, certainly we'll get back to doing it weekly and, you know, continue continue this great run. I mean, 
what a what a great season to start a Cardinals podcast, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I, we picked the right one, right? All right, folks, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.